Once again at Ash, one of the more popular sessions has to do with newly approved drugs. How do you use them and just exactly what do you need to know to clinically use them effectively. And so this one, uh, this time around, we're talking about a recombinant coagulation factor 9 albumin fusion protein. And it's approved for use in children and adults with hemophilia B. And to talk about it, I'm with Dr. Stephen Pipe, who's an MD and a professor of pediatrics and pathology, as well as director of the Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at the University of Michigan. First off, let's talk about this new agent. What is it that clinicians need to know? So the big takeaways for me is uh, with the advent of the availability of these uh, extended half-life uh, factor molecules, we really have an opportunity for uh, another um, shift in the way we deliver prophylaxis to prevent uh, bleeding. Um, if you look at the, the waves of therapy over the years, we went from having no treatment to then availability of uh, on-demand only, right. and then uh, we started doing prophylaxis uh, more aggressively just in the last uh, couple of decades. And it's a really high intensity um, uh, uh, style of, of care, um, for even for hemophilia B patients, which have a more favorable pharmacokinetics than factor eight does, it's still about two to three weeks IV infusion uh, every week for a patient. Right. And the half-life extension with this molecule uh, was five-fold that of the conventional recombinant factor nine. And what that translates to a patient is once a week dosing for sure is uh, providing uh, uh, efficacious uh, control and prevention of bleeding. But um, beyond that, we're now achieving factor trough levels that are substantially higher than we could ever achieve even with aggressive prophylactic regimens before. So if I think about my own patients who have uh, um, a hemophilia B, um, I might be satisfied with trough levels with the conventional agents that are in that you know, 1 to 3 percent range. Right. And uh, from the data from the clinical trial programs, uh, with really a relatively non-intensive uh, either Q-week dosing or even Q-2-week dosing, um, the plasma levels that are achieved are in the 10 to 20 percent range uh, with, with, with this strategy. Better. It's much better. Now, this is the first coagulation factor albumin fusion protein to be approved, the second factor 9 fusion protein product. Where does the earlier product fit in now? I mean, you've got two options. What's the difference? So, so it's a similar mechanism of action. Uh, the previously approved product was an FC fusion. Um, this is an albumin fusion. It turns out that they both take advantage of this recycling pathway for endocytose proteins uh, um, uh, to guide them away from intracellular degradation and return them back to the plasma. So there's really no difference in the molecular mechanism. Um, uh, the uh, strategy uh, for this one resulted in a little bit more favorable pharmacokinetics than the previous agent. But if you look at the prophylactic regimens uh, between the trials, they aren't, they aren't so different. Um, we have a longer uh, experience with the, uh, the previous uh, FC Fusion product and I think we'll gain uh, you know, uh, additional experience with this albumin fusion going forward. But I think they're both um, really welcome additions to our portfolio for treating patients. What have you learned over the course of treating a few patients in terms of optimal use? So uh, I think I'm... I'm definitely taking advantage of the uh, less intensity uh, prophylaxis. You know, a, there's some sweet spot about a, a weekly dose for, for a patient. It's very easy to incorporate into their, into their, uh, their busy lives. Um, and with such high efficacy, I think it's a really nice outcome for patients. But um, beyond that, I think because we're achieving higher trough levels than we've had before, I think over multiple decades, we're going to see improved joint outcomes uh, in patients. The reality is with the existing agents, we know that annualized bleed rates are not zero. Um, so it might seem like a very low bleed rate on traditional uh, prophylaxis, maybe you know, one bleed a year is what would be typical in a pediatric patient, but think about that one bleed every year year after year, decade after decade, does that have any implications for long-term joint outcomes? There's some data to, that suggests that we are still seeing some joint disease in even young adults who've been through the prophylaxis era. 
So I believe as we incorporate these agents, because they're going to be sustaining much higher uh, background uh, factor nine levels, that I believe we're going to see improved joint outcomes down the line. It may take 25, 30 years to really prove what a difference it made, um, but I think we're going to get there. What questions are you getting from clinicians? You've done this special session now, so what are they interested after you've given your presentation and you've talked about it? So, t two things. Um, number one is, well, how do you manage any breakthrough bleeding that does occur? Um, since the patients already have a much higher sort of level on these agents, is it safe if they have a breakthrough bleed to use the same agent on top of that? Um, I believe we're gaining experience that that is true. In fact, the clinical trials told us that. They were not prescribed two different agents, a conventional one and the extended half-life right. during the trial. And so I'm not using them that way either. And uh, I'm, I'm not having any uh, you know, problems of administering it in that fashion. Um, so the, the second uh, scenario relates to management of surgery. And this is where these agents really shine, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, if you, if, if you think about a major surgery for hemophilia patient, those patients are going to be admitted to hospital, we're going to fully correct them up to the normal range, and then we're going to be doing frequent infusions afterwards to keep their level up in the normal range. Because of the, the pharmacokinetics with these new agents being so favorable, you're now talking about a single preoperative infusion, and for several days, they're maintained in the normal range. So it will change the paradigms of even how you, you go about managing a patient for, for a surgery. If this is typically an outpatient procedure, you may now be able to do this an outpatient procedure with a hemophilia patient with these agents. In fact, they could even probably dose at home before they came for their surgery that day and they wouldn't need another follow-up dose probably for several days after. Um, I, I presented the data from the, uh, the surgery study for the albumin uh, fusion factor 9. And what really struck me is these were major surgeries, uh, a number of patients with uh, uh, total knee uh, arthroplasties. Um, how few infusions were actually needed to cover them adequately over a 14-day period? Some patients had as few as six or seven doses over a 14-day period. And uh, even though I'm a pediatric treater, I know from my adult colleagues that uh, managing a hemophilia patient through arthroplasty required very intensive uh, you know, inpatient uh, exactly. coverage and then even intensive uh, prophylaxis at home. So this is, this is a paradigm shift in the management of peris, perisurgical care. So I think those are the two takeaways for um, uh, clinicians that they, they ask about because these are real real world uh, right. uh, uses and uh, I, I think the studies are giving them a great confidence about how to how to actually use these in those scenarios and are patients happy 100 <laughs> um, percent so I can <laughs> tell you once once a patient has been on these products no one is asking to go back to the conventional agents um, yeah absolutely well, thank you very much for your time, and this is a, always a, a, a fun thing to do because there's already so many uh, new drugs that are around. So I thank you for your opportunity to chat with me for a few minutes. We have a lot of stuff from uh, ASH 2016 up online as well as in print. Please check ASH Clinical News. I'm Rick McGuire.